headphones aren't on. <laughs> oh, you're playing with your mini plunger? Yes. Good. Uh, Happy New Year. It's 2018. It is. Can you believe it? Yes. What's your resolution? Mm, realistically, I want to be better with my budget because oh. I've never actually, like, I've always, like, put money aside, but mm-hmm. I've never, like, really, like, written down a budget and stuck to it. Mm. And then I want to be better with paperwork. Like, oh. I want to, like, start writing things down more. I need to get better at that, too. That'll I, benef- those, are, those are boring. I don't have anything. No, it's good. It'll benefit the podcast, too. Oh, okay. Yeah. We'll use it for good and evil. <laughs> wow. What are your resolutions? Um, I just want to be healthier. I feel like I haven't taken as good care of myself. Shedding for the wedding? Well, that too, but also like with the crumbs and everything, I just haven't been as careful as I should be. So mm. my goal is to try and be more careful with myself and healthier with myself and uh, and my mental health, you know? Just like, I think the lists will help with my mental health as yeah, well. Yeah, I feel like lists always help me like kind of compartmentalize, like put things aside when I don't need to cool. panic about them. So that might help you. To-do lists. Love a good to-do Love list. Love a good to-do list. My resolution is to make more to-do lists, Let's I think. Let's just to-do list the hell out of 2018. My Okay, another resolution that we should have together is that by the end of the year, we're somehow on tour doing something cool. Fuck yeah, we better met at least some in the you. talks we gotta meet some we've of got you. 365 days guys let's meet jessica make it happen jessica <laughs> jessica the one who handles everything make yeah, it happen but jessica we're trying to go fund me her to meet us so it's not really her doing everyone else everyone else make a go fund me for jessica and she will make it happen bring jessica to us now <laughs> um yes come see us at crime con 2018 uh, this is out in January, so we I assume we have posted the promo code by now, or we're posting it ASAP, so go check it out. We want you to come at a discounted price in Nashville, Tennessee in May. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I just want to say before we get into stories that a lot of people have uh, asked about the episode that was um, one before last about your mom getting kicked out of a Ramada, and you and I kind of glossed over it because we're like, haha, oh, Linda. And everyone went, no, 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 no. You guys have <laughs> you guys have to rewind. And I tagged you in a couple of posts on Facebook and you didn't respond, so I thought, fine, um, you just, just call gotta, me out in person. You gotta tell us in person. So uh, I, I don't know if she I think she was kicked out. Uh, I think she was banned and blacklisted, but now it's been so long that like maybe she's not on a list anymore or people just don't I feel like Ramada is one of those like decades old hotels where yeah, I f- they might get for a up. long time she was no longer welcome back. <laughs> I don't I don't know if she's still no longer welcome back and they've just gotten lazy in like in telling her she can't be there because I know she's been to a few cents. But anyway, I digress. So the main story is she is one of the reasons that when you go to a hotel, <laughs> they I have the story. <laughs> Everyone, thank my mother for this. She's the reason why when you go to hotels now, they have notes everywhere that say you can't hang clothes on fire sprinklers. (laughs) Or like, you know how that's also common sense. But my mom didn't have that sense of reason, I suppose. She uh, was hanging one of her business suits. She needed a hook. She couldn't find a hook. She saw like a metal sprinkler from the ceiling. And I guess the... The if you ever look closely at one of those sprinklers, inside it is a little glass capsule of mercury. Because oh, fuck. if there's ever fire, it that glass is supposed to be so thin that it bursts and the mercury will oh, sense the sprinklers no. and trigger the sprinklers to turn on or something like that. So she, the hanger she threw onto the sprinkler, knocked into the glass casing of mercury and set off the water system for the entire hotel and caused $20,000 in damage to the hotel, including her work computer. So, you know, poor her. Oh, my God. Um, And she was asked to no longer come back or be a part of that hotel. I just, pe- oh. people, there was a Facebook thread of people being like, why do you think M's mom was kicked out of her I did see that where they were like, let's just make up a reason and one of us is bound to be right. Also, at one point, she, um, I think this was also in Aramada, she got a can of pepper spray and wanted to test it. Mm-hmm. 
and was like, oh, if I like spray it in the corner of the room, what? like no, away from me. You never do that. She just wanted to see like, if she wanted to make sure that the spray part was like on, like right. to make sure like if she sprayed it, it would work. Uh-huh. She sprayed it and didn't think where she was spraying it and sprayed it directly into the vents. No. And so she pepper sprayed a whole floor of people. <laughs> Like it went, the vents, it, the pepper spray went into everyone's room and everyone started screaming on her floor and she's like, what's wrong? And apparently a lot of people got pepper sprayed and maced by my mom. So she's got a few of those stories. Listen, we all wanted to hear the story. Well, you got a bonus one too. I mean, I, okay. So this is the thing I was prepping for this episode and I was talking to my mom and I was like, just out of curiosity. Cause I was like, sounds like some shit my mom would do. So I was like have you ever been kicked out anything she goes oh yes (laughs) and i was like wait what she goes oh the local youth soccer club in cincinnati and i was like the hell why what she goes you know the local youth soccer i'm like i don't know what you're talking about what a specific place to get kicked out of i know and i was like what do you mean and she literally texts me (laughs) she said (laughs) i said what i said lol why and she goes for attacking a kid who licked Alexander's arm five times. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> the fifth time was just too much for Renata that <laughs> day. four times were okay. Yeah. But so then I'm like, licked his arm. And she goes, kicked. And I was like, oh, so you hit L instead of K. It was kicked his arm. But oh. for like a solid 10 minutes, I was like, what the actual hell? <laughs> so I'm like, what do you mean? And she texts me. I just feel like I have to tone this down because it gets a little... Risque. Just just a little much. Gotcha. My brother was probably, I don't know, seven or something. She goes, I, I walked during the game onto the field, grabbed that. <laughs> Shitty kid. <laughs> Maybe I can read it. Grabbed that nasty ass, red haired, freckled, huge, tall, white kid by his scruff. What? <laughs> and whispered in his ear that if he kicks my kid one more time, I will <laughs> kick his ass. What? <laughs> what? I, I, I will climb in his window during the night <laughs> and break his legs. <laughs> wow. Renata had a bad day, apparently. And then she wrote a new text message that said, <laughs> Whimsy little shit dropped on the ground sobbing. <laughs> That kid didn't have any spine. She didn't even touch him. <laughs> and I was like, what? what the fuck? And she goes, don't worry. All the parents thanked me. I was like, yeah, I'm fucking sure. <laughs> <laughs> what were they going to say? Like, they were going to get in the way of that woman? No, no. If you know someone who's getting married, like me. Or my mom. You should listen up because we want to tell you about Zola. Zola is reinventing the wedding registry and planning process to make the happiest moments in couples' lives even happier. It's free, it's easy to use, and it's fun. Join over 300,000 couples who have used Zola. Zola Registry has everything you love about your favorite department store, plus things like honeymoon funds, fitness classes, wine subscriptions, and everything else Christine could possibly love. All of it. They have over 500 top brands and 50,000 gifts, experiences, and cash funds. I want to add all of them to my registry. It's so easy to use for couples and their guests. It's a friendly customer service team that will help go above and beyond helping pick out the perfect blender, walking a grandmother through a couple's (laughs) registry, doing all the stuff that you hate. (laughs) Amen. There's group gifting as a feature, which lets multiple guests contribute to big ticket gifts, which is such a good thing. Big ticket for Linda. (laughs) Uh, Just one yacht. (laughs) One large yacht, please. You can personalize your registry with photos and notes about why you're uh, coveting. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, I don't speak English. That's my favorite part about ads is when you'd ask me if the things are a word. <laughs> Coveting certain gifts. Uh, there's price matching, free shipping every day. There, it's a top-rated app for iPhone, iPad, and Apple Watch. So you can even do it right from your wrist. Oh, my God. So couples can manage their registries on the go. This is a game changer. Uh, Zola has a free suite of wedding planning tools, so it's not just a registry. Those tools include free wedding websites, uh, a couple Zola registry automatically integrates into your Zola wedding website so guests can seamlessly shop and get all the details they need in one place. Zola's other wedding planning tools include a customizable checklist and a guest list manager. 
Uh, Zola's full suite of tools can be managed from the Zola Weddings app for iPhone and Android. Ooh. And Apple Watch, apparently. Apparently. To sign up with Zola and receive a $50 credit towards your registry, go to Zola.com slash drink. That's Z-O-L-A dot com slash drink for $50 towards your registry. And I will say it is Christine approved because I'm getting married and I love it. It's also Linda approved because she has already told me a million times how much she's loving it. So... I you've mean, got two reviews right there two of the top reviews that you'll ever know you don't need any more than that and that's why we drink and that's why we drink anyway apparently we drink we drank on the first of the year is it the first it's the 31st plus is seven the Sunday. yeah but we just had the whole conversation about resolutions oh god damn it uh this is what happens when you try to be prepared and do things in advance and then we don't know calendars this is why we don't prepare for anything. anyway you just heard a whole conversation into the future's future wait so we're literally not in the fucking future it's still 2017 guys God damn it we got 24 more hours of this bullshit i'll let you know my resolutions in 24 hours and that's why we drink fuck it let's just tell a ghost story tell me something okay so this is one of the i don't i don't remember what the stat was it's like either the oldest possession in england oh or like one of the earliest possessions Ooh. on record in england something like that Anyway, it's the 1700s, and it's in Yatton, England. Great. Although I'm sure they say Yatton, because they pronounce they their say, T's. They say, Harry Potter, you're a wizard, Harry. <laughs> this isn't muggle cast. <laughs> Hi, Eric. <laughs> so, um, in the 1700s, this is 1769, mm-hmm. the main character's name is George Lukens, or Luckens. We're going to go with Lukens. George Lucas? Yes. Oh, okay. He was possessed in 1769. He's so old. He's lived several lives. Wow. Um, he started claiming after he did some acting in a Christmas play. Oh, my. That he felt a divine slap in the face, which had him fall over, hit the ground, and left him possessed by demons. <laughs> Wait. Hold on. He felt a divine slap. So, like, from God? or I like- think so. And then not God, much else was said. God was like, I'm going to slap you to the ground so demons can take over. Yeah, look, I think by divine, maybe in the 1760s, that meant like supernatural. They meant just hellish just slap a, in the face. Yep. Okay. And uh, great. I'm on board. Okay. Let's go. So then um, right off the bat, he also used to be known as like a really like, like normal guy, like totally chill. And he was in his 40s at the time this happened. Okay. In his 30s, 40s. And so he already had a reputation for being a normal person, never had any weird behavior. Joe but Schmel. after this happened, witnesses started saying that he could not hear any virtuous expressions or any religious expressions or see any religious relics without experiencing incredible pain. Oh, no. Um, he also was described as emaciated and an exhausted figure from not being able to eat, but while contorting his body for hours on end every day. What? Just a rant. It happened out of nowhere. So then he started going to doctors to try to get the shit taken care of. And one of the doctors that examined him said to prove himself bewitched, because immediately he believed he was possessed by demons. Sure. To prove himself bewitched, he gave me and many others um, relations of the power of witches. I don't know what that (laughs) means, but I think he was like, no, really, I'm possessed. Look at all this information I know about witches. Oh, I thought he meant he was like, oh, he set me up with some witches on, like, well, like, eHarmony. I was going to say, (laughs) J-Date, but witches? (laughs) On E, non-harmony. Never mind. Just keep going. He also, uh, when he was also wondering if it was supernatural, he also started looking towards magicians to solve his problem. Chris Angel will not get you out of this mess, my friend. Or magic practitioners, excuse me. Oh, oh, that's different. That is different. Sure. I just wanted to see what you would say if I gave you that information. You know I'm going to talk about Chris <laughs> Angel. You know I'm always going to talk about Chris Angel. One woman prescribed a rolled up brown paper bag mm-hmm. with pins driven into it and then burnt in a fire. Mm, yes, that is. I prescribed that as well. Oh, right. Okay. During his uh, convulsing fits. Mm, sure. Other people insisted that uh, he was just bewitched and there's nothing they could do. And he was convinced that something magical was causing this. And so convinced that he began attacking elderly women in an attempt to draw their blood to pure his blood. To purify Uh, his blood. 
he was ultimately um, looked at by more doctors, obviously. Mm-hmm. And uh, basically, he following his hospital stay, he lived in a... Br- oh, I thought it said he lived in a brothel. That would have been interesting. I was excited for that. He lived at home with his brother. <laughs> <laughs> he lived Whoops. in a brother. So he lived at home with his brother and unable to deal with George, um, his brother forced him to move out and he moved into a house with a guy named Richard. While staying with Richard, the fit seemed to end. Um, and so he thought he could move back home and the episodes just stopped happening for like a decade. A decade? Yeah, wow. where he was, like, convulsing and yeah, just, like, couldn't be around religious relics. Sure. However, in 1787, the Caesars returned. Oh, no. And this time, instead of claiming that the attacks came from witchcraft, he was absolutely convinced that he was possessed by the devil. So he went from, like, maybe I'm possessed to this is definitely some black magic to, okay, now I'm really possessed. Satan after a 10-year hiatus. It's here. So... Now it's 1787, and he was still being described after this 10-year break as an extraordinary man of good character, um, and he had constantly attended church and the sacrament. He then, when all of a sudden these seizures started happening, not only were the seizures happening, but he was starting to snarl like an animal, Mm. bark like a dog, sing hymns backwards, (gasps) chanting in a foreign language that he didn't know. Spoke in both the voice of a man and a woman, sometimes at the same time. (laughs) Wait. And he would blurt out vulgar obscenities for no apparent reason. His convulsing came back and he would walk on all fours downstairs. Mm, No. No, thank you. And he was thrown about by unseen hands. The the walking down the stairs on... No. So, these weird episodes were completely unpredictable. They could last up to an hour and they happened for years on end. So, like, he just, like... Not like he was walking downstairs for several years in a row, <laughs> but like it was one of those MC Escher where the <laughs> stairs never end. So he's just walking down the stairs forever and ever. So like these bouts, like he, they just weren't going away. They weren't ending like the previous time. And they were, they ended up putting him in a mental institution for two years where all diagnoses and treatments failed. Yikes. Um, they kept trying to say, okay, maybe it's uh, epilepsy, or maybe it's Tourette's, or maybe it's schizophrenia. schizophrenia. And so, and no medicine was working, no therapy was working. So these episodes became more and more paranormally intense. Great. So he would have violent outbursts where he would claw and bite people or smash items with inhuman strength. Mm. Um, he would speak in voices that were not his own. He also showed a profound aversion to religious symbols again. Uh, he told people that he was possessed by seven distinct demons Great. that would require seven priests to eject them from him. Uh, okay. And they think that seven is significant because in the New Testament, Mary Magdalene was possessed by seven demons. Mm. So one minister um, had known George for a long time and said of him, Quote, whatever was tormenting him was obviously taking a toll on his health as he had wasted away into an emaciated, withered looking husk of his former self. So he's like falling apart. Yikes. Uh, Anglican reverend in Bristol named Joseph Easterbrook. Mm, sure. He was the vicar of the town's temple church and he heard about Lucan's or George, you know, whatever you want to call him that day. George. Um, heard about him through the town because one of the people in georgestown wrote to this uh right. reverend and was like okay seriously you gotta help this guy help um so he was originally rejected um from being allowed to perform an exorcism but after trying multiple times he was able to uh rally a bunch of ministers that like didn't know each other before he had to like find a little like a team that was willing to like go about it because at the time nobody wanted to because it was becoming so widely publicized that everyone was like i don't, I don't want to deal with this. Do with this yeah so you define like basically the island of misfit priests so it's <laughs> and he like i was about to say something like that like it's it's one of those superhero movies where they're like nobody wants to do this so let's get all the underdogs like hashtag actually thanks priest <laughs> thanks priest for once we mean it literally for once <laughs> so then uh so it was six other ministers, so they had all seven of them, mm-hmm. um, and they arranged an exorcism on Friday the 13th. No way. In June of 1788. 
stupid. The exorcism started with George singing in a high-pitched voice, which slowly but then quickly dropped into a deep, deep timber that he could not make his own, on his own. Ugh. And it taunted the ministers and told them that they would fail. Then started picking at them individually about things that he would have never known about them. Oh, no. He alternated between a man's voice, a woman's voice, and a child's voice. And then a really, really, really deep voice that there's no way he could have done on his own. While shouting rants, threats of violence, and singing a love song. No. Other voices began popping through um, and talking about different things while also taking turns to sing, bark, growl, babble, brag about their vast powers, and speak in Latin backwards. Oh. Okay. George also sang out a hymn of praise to the devil, proclaiming that the devil is the supreme leader of all things. And without implying that the devil was possessing him, he said, so that makes me the supreme leader of all things. No. His body contorted so much that it required more than two men to hold him down as the ministers prayed over him. And when asked why they were torturing George, one of the demons shouted out with his mouth closed so that I may show my power among men. <gasps> Jesus Christ. Uh, George also swore by his infernal den that he would not leave. And by George, we mean whatever was inside of George. Right, right. And when the priest began singing hymns, George's face distorted, his body began to spasm, and he was doing making strange agitations on his face. He then, quote, vowed eternal vengeance on the miserable objects and on those present for daring to oppose him and commanded his faithful and obedient servants from hell to appear and take their stations. <laughs> what the fuck? That sounds like some shit that, like, if you're babysitting a kid in the middle of the yes. night, they just start saying that kind of shit. Yes. Take your stations. It's like demons. Yeah. My demon. So after, I don't know how it was so easy, but after two hours of intense prayer... George began to praise God and say that the evil presences were gone. Oh, okay. Great. Just like a like just a quick cleanup. Just like, like, oh, let me mop that up real quick. Just like say say like uh uh on on eagle's wings, like yep. sing it a couple times. Everything's Joyful, fine. joyful. <laughs> Ave Maria. They just we're played fine. Sister Act actually, and then he was fine by the end. Oh, Whoopi they... changed him. Whoopi changed him. I mean, Whoopi changes us all. <laughs> so uh, those who are present swear, swear, swear that this was a genuine demonic possession, but everyone else in town is like, mm, okay, like Sister Act isn't that fucking convincing. <laughs> Whoopi can't change all of us. <laughs> so there were a lot of people who criticized him saying that before he was ever, quote, possessed, he was known in town as a ventriloquist and prankster. Shut the fuck up. So apparently on all articles i read that wasn't a one-time thing a every ventriloquist everyone mentioned that he was a ventriloquist I mean, come on um he also wanted to get into acting and uh, couldn't and so he stuck with ventriloquism and was known around town as like a jokester hey do you live in la are you a failing actor <laughs> oh are you like part of uh an improv show or anything like that do you or? know a priest because <laughs> we can get you famous uh, others said that George merely suffered from a form of epilepsy, which the clergy just exaggerated for the time just to oh. get exorcisms, like, sure, they were to like, make them aware. Right, right. Um, some say the demonic possession was totally made up by George so that he could avoid having to go to work, which sounds a lot like some shit I would pull. Uh, right? I'd be like, I don't want to go. I'm not above go. it. <laughs> Can you imagine if I could just text my fucking boss and be like, look, I'm possessed today. Listen. All right. Satan is here. So. I sense him in me. Take your stations. I'll come <laughs> take, in tomorrow. Take your fucking stations. Okay. <laughs> Clock me off for the next three days. <laughs> Actually, for the next two hours. I just need to watch this direct. For <laughs> so George's exorcism turned out to be one of the most hotly debated and today still considered one of the most controversial exorcisms that the country ever had. Um, just because there's no proof and based on everything that witnesses swear by, how's that in two hours? Like, you know, he's totally fine. Right, right. Because uh, later in life, he experienced no further incidents of demonic possession and returned to a quiet, humble life. He eventually returned home to Yatton um, due to the negative, like, public reaction of him trying to live in a normal town. Everyone was like, <laughs> literally go the fuck home. This was too much. Listen, go back to Yatton. Like, you're being way extra. Get out of our normal ass town. 
He ended up living a poor, poor life financially. He was a bookseller and a bill sticker, but was fired from both jobs (gasps) and lived most of his life after the after the possession of begging on the streets until he died alone in 1805. Well, that's really sad. Well, that was his life. Happy New Year, guys. Happy New Year. Damn. Anyway, that was a short one, but a few people had requested it, and I wanted to make sure that they noticed that I noticed that they asked about it. Listen, we see you. We see you. I got a doozy for you, so I just got to jump right in. Yay! I'm going to tell you the story of the original Night Stalker. <gasps> no. Like Richard Ramirez? No. Oh. The original Night Stalker. What the fuck does that mean? AKA the East Area Rapist, AKA the Diamond Knot Killer, AKA the Golden State Killer. Shit. Today, uh, I was researching this and one of my coworkers, Josh, was like, oh, what are you guys working on? And like, I haven't gotten notes back, so I haven't been working on my script yet. And I said... Oh, the East Area Rapist. And he goes, what? And I said, I'm reading about the East Area Rapist. And I said that like four times and he kept looking at me. He's like, that's probably not Nickelodeon friendly, dude. Like, (laughs) Well, no. He like looks at me and he goes, what? And I was like, the East Area Rapist. And then he finally goes to uh, our other coworker, Joanna, and goes, do you know what the Easter Egg Rapist is? And I was like, (gasps) no, not the Easter Egg Rapist, you psycho. And he goes, you just said the Easter Egg Rapist like four times. So I want to (laughs) clarify. In case you're saying it wrong and you're all slurred for some reason. It's not the Easter egg rapist. It's the fucking East Area rapist. Just to clarify, okay? Sure. Um, so this guy is extremely famous. Um, he has his own subreddit called Eron's, which was a um, moniker that a writer came up with when she was studying him. Um, stands for East Area Rapist slash Original Night Stalker. So okay. E-A-R-O-N-S, I see. Eron's. So, as we already clarified, the original Night Stalker is not Richard Ramirez, but is the name given to an unidentified serial killer and rapist who was active in Southern California from 1979 to 1986. Shit. And whose crimes initially centered on East Sacramento, where at least 50 women were raped between June... 50? Yep. Between June 18th, 1976 and July 5th, 1979. He's also known as the East Area Rapist. So... I'm just going to start. Just do it. Start with the timeline. So the East Area Rapist struck for the first time on June 18th, 1976 at 4 a.m. in Ranch Cordova, California. Within six months, seven additional attacks were committed by the same man who wore a ski mask every time he attacked. Most victims had seen or heard a prowler on their property before the attacks, and a lot of them had suffered (laughs) break-ins leading up to the attacks. Oh, shit. Police believe the offender had a pattern of stalking his victims in a targeted neighborhood before selecting one for attack, specifically. Oh, no. As part of his surveillance, he would call victims before and after the night of the attack, sometimes hanging up, sometimes pretending to have the wrong number. Uh, By November of 1976, the East Area Rapist struck twice in one day in nearby neighborhoods. And by April of 1977, there were over 15 attacks by the ski mask rapist, and um, the Sacramento Sheriff's, Depar- Sheriff's Department was no closer to catching him. So after 15 attacks in like a short amount of time, the police department was still kind of floundering for answers. Shit. So during this time, uh, the East Area Rapist began making phone calls to police and victims. Although so far he'd only targeted women who were alone at the time of the attack, uh, in April of 1977, he threatened to kill his first couple. So panic in the area was at an all-time high. Uh, One of the calls he made, one of the early calls, was to cops in December of 1977. Um, All the recordings of these, by the way, that I mentioned are online, and I I listen to them. It's highly creepy. Oh, shit. The FBI released all the recordings of these. So in the call, you hear someone answering, sheriff speaking, sheriff's department speaking, and he responds, you're never going to catch me. East area rapist, you dumb fuckers. I'm going to fuck again tonight. Careful. Oh, fuck. One of his previous victims received a call um, about a week later on December 9th, 1977. She recognized the voice on the other end of the line as her attacker because she had already been a victim of his. And he simply said, Merry Christmas. It's me again. <gasps> and then hung up. There was another call a little while later. Um, that police kind of put together later on. Uh, a victim 
a future victim. This was before she was attacked. She received a seemingly wrong number. And the call went like this. She answered, hello. And the caller said, yeah, is Ray there? She said, pardon. And he said, is Ray there? She said, I'm sorry, you must have the wrong number. And he says, sorry, and hung up. That same day, this the victim received another call, much more sinister in nature, but it was also recorded and identified as being the voice of her assailant. Uh, the same guy called and said, gonna kill you, gonna kill you, gonna kill you, bitch, 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 fucking whore. And you can listen to it online. It is very unsettling. Fuck. So that call uh, was made to the very first rape victim that had ever been reported of his. So that was a call to his first ever victim out of anybody. Um, A little bit later, a volunteer for the contact counseling service answered a call from a man who claimed to the who claimed to be the East Area rapist. The caller said, can you help me? And the volunteer said, what's the problem? The caller said, I have a problem. I need help because I don't want to do this anymore. The volunteer said, do what? And he said, well, I guess I can tell you guys. You're not tracing this call, are you? No, we are not tracing any calls. I am the East Side Rapist, and I feel the urge coming on to do this again. I don't want to do it, but then I do. Is there anyone there that can help me? I don't want to hurt these women or their husbands anymore. The voice was pleading, but then became violent again. Are you tracing this call? The volunteer said, we're not tracing this call. Do you want a counselor? And the caller said, no, I've been to counseling all my life. I was in Stockton State Hospital. I shouldn't tell you that. I guess I can trust you guys. Are you tracing this call? The volunteer said, no, we are not tracing the call. And then the caller said very angrily, I believe you are tracing this call and hung up. In December of 1977, the editor of the Sacramento Bee, the Sacramento Mayor's Office, and the KVIE6 TV station received a letter from the East Area Rapist. It featured a poem called Excitement's Crave. And it talked about mortals and his own power, yada, 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 kind of that stereotypical, Mm -hmm. like, serial... Power struggle kind of thing. Yeah, serial killer, like, you can't get me. Yeah. I'm not a mortal, blah, blah, blah. Like a above all sovereign citizen. Totally. Super ego. Yep. Um, about a week later, investigators discovered three notebook pages near the scene of one of the East Area Rapist attacks where a suspicious vehicle had reportedly been parked. The pages have been dubbed the homework because the first page features an essay about General Custer. The second page is a journal style entry where the author writes about a school teacher who made him write lines and how humiliating it was. And then, oh, and the journal entry is titled Mad is the Word. And the essay starts, Mad is the Word that Reminds Me of Sixth Grade. I'm like, sounds like what? my ninth grade journal. Yeah. <laughs> sounds like a Fall Out Boy song. <laughs> it does sound like a Fall Out Boy song. Um, and then the third page featured something called the Punishment Map, which was a hand-drawn map of what appears to be a suburban neighborhood, which one detective believed to be um, a map to a fantasy location representing the East Area Rapist's desired stalking ground. So he thought he had just made this up as like Ew. his fantasy stalking ground. And then on the back of the map uh, was written the word punishment, just scrawled across in big letters. Shit. Over and over, just scribbled on it. Gross. On February 2nd, 1978, a young couple in Sacramento, um, the man was named Brian Maggiori and he was a military policeman at Mather Air Force Base and his wife Katie were walking their dog um, when a man approached them and began to chase them and when they fled he shot them both dead Fuck! and their deaths were later attributed to the East Area Rapist suddenly the call stopped the attack stopped and investigators were baffled it just completely stopped um What investigators now know is that the East Area Rapist moved from Northern California to the Bay Area and then Southern California, which took a long time to figure out because the precincts, like, you know, the jurisdictions were so different across the state, Um, especially at the time. There wasn't DNA testing yet and all that. Um, So it took police a while to link them, but precincts began contacting each other to warn them when he was on the move. They noticed that he had developed a pretty consistent M.O. Um, He used to target single women or women who were home alone, and now he preferred to target couples. So he had kind of, like, transitioned into attacking couples. 
What he would do, this is his MO. I, I, yeah. He would break in. I already know. Just go. You do just know? Do just, I think, just do it. Just go. He would break in, wake up the occupants, threaten them with a handgun. Then he would bind them, often blindfolding and or gagging them with towels that he took from their own house and cut into strips carefully. He would force the female victim to tie up the male with bootlaces mm -hmm. before she was tied up herself, and then he would separate them. He would stack dishes on the back of the male victim, then tell him if he heard any rattling, he would kill everyone in the house. Oh, fuck. Um, he would then spend hours in the house, ransacking closets and drawers, eating the victim's food, coming in to utter more threats. Sometimes he would be in the home so long that the victims weren't sure if he had left. So it was reported that in some instances, the victims believed he had left and started to like move <clears throat> only to see him quote, jump from the darkness. Cause he was fuck still there. And then he wouldn't kill them. Um, sometimes he would, sometimes he wouldn't. Shit. He had like a mixed track record. On October 1st, 1979, an intruder broke into the home of a couple living in Goleta, California. So now he had moved to uh, Southern California, which was like, these these are the crimes that weren't initially connected to the rapes in, to the serial rapist in Northern California. So this is where it kind of split off for almost decades until they could actually verify that this was the same person. Mm. So, um... On October 1st, 1979, an intruder broke into the home of a couple living in Goleta, California. He tied them up and began to chant, I'll kill him, repeatedly to himself. When he left the room briefly, the couple tried to escape, and the woman began to scream. The intruder fled. Their neighbor happened to be an FBI agent. Oh, good. Convenient. <laughs> Maybe that's why she screamed. She was like, Maybe. be ready. Seriously. Who pursued the attacker? The attacker dropped his bike and a knife and got away. On December 30th, 1979, Dr. Robert Offerman, 44, and Dr. Deborah Alexander Manning, 35, were found shot dead at Offerman's condo in Goleta, California. The bindings that had been on him were untied, indicating that he had gotten free and lunged at the attacker. Uh, prints from a large dog were also found at the scene, leading investigators to believe the killer brought it with him. Uh, oh, there's shit. also evidence that the killer fed the dog some leftover Christmas turkey from the fridge. Ugh. A few months later, on March 13th, Charlene Smith, who's 33, and Lyman Smith, 43, who was about to be appointed as a local judge, were found murdered in their homes in Ventura. Charlene had been raped. A log from the fireplace was used to bludgeon both victims to death, and their wrists had been tied with a drapery cord. The cord was unusual in that it featured an unusual Chinese knot called the diamond knot. So that's why he's sometimes called the diamond knot killer. Mm. It's a very, like, specific knot. On August 19th, Keith Harrington, 24, and Patrice Harrington, 27, were found bludgeoned to death in their home on Cockleshell Drive um, in a gated community. Patrice had also been raped. Um, Patrice was a nurse in Irvine, and Keith was a medical student at University of California, Irvine. Keith Harrington's brother later spent nearly $2 million supporting California Proposition 69, which allows for the collection of DNA samples from all felons and from people who have been arrested for certain crimes. Good. So that's like a really cool cause, at least that small thing that came out of it. Yeah. Um, on February 6th, Manuela Wittoon, 28, was raped and murdered in her home in Irvine. Detectives remarked that her television was found in the backyard which was possibly the killer's attempt to make it appear like a botched robbery. Mm. On July 27th, Sherry Domingo and Gregory Sanchez, 35 and 27 respectively, became the 10th and 11th murder victims of the original Night Stalker. Both were attacked in Domingo's house on Toytec Way in Galeta. The offender had entered the property via a small window in the bathroom, and she had been raped and bludgeoned. A single piece of shipping twine was found near the bed, and fibers of an unknown source were scattered all over her body. Then on May 4th, Janelle Lisa Cruz, who was 18, was found bludgeoned to death in her Irvine home. Her family was on vacation in Mexico at the time of the attack. A pipe wrench was reported missing by her stepfather and was thought to be the probable murder weapon. She had also been raped. This was Shit. the last known crime associated with the original Night Stalker. So it wasn't known until years later that all of these cases, which were across several counties um, in Southern California, were linked in Northern California. 
Although uh, many investigators had suspected the link, it wasn't until 2001 that forensic testing could, like, verify that they were connected. Mm -hmm. So these were happening in the 70s, 60s and 70s. So it wasn't until 2001 that they could be sure they were looking for the same guy. Uh, throughout the years, several suspects were questioned and then released. All in all, he had attacked across 15 different jurisdictions all the way through the state of California. He had committed over 50 rapes, over 12 murders, and over 120 residential burglaries. As of today, his whereabouts are still unknown. The FBI is currently offering a $50,000 reward for any information leading to his arrest and conviction, and they've developed a nationwide multimedia campaign to bring the case back to the public's attention. So the campaign includes... So this is, like, very new. So this is... Like 2017, 2016 mm -hmm. at the latest is like when all this information is coming out. So the campaign includes victim testimonies, updated composite sketches of what the killer might look like today, mm -hmm. um, as well as a voice recording of the subject. Uh, if you have any information, you can re report it anonymously by calling 1-800-CALL-FBI or visiting tips.fbi.gov. They're still looking for any lead they can get. Um, they did create a psychological profile, so I'm going to give you just a fun little list of what we're looking for. Yeah. Um, so experts think that this man, the East Area Rapist slash original Night Stalker, Eurons, is a white male who is dressed well and would not stand out in upscale neighborhoods. He drives a well-maintained car, had an emotional age of 26 to 30 at the time the crimes were committed, so would currently be around 60 to 75 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, engaged in deviant, paraphilic behavior and brutal sex in his personal life. Shit. Engaged in sex with sex, sex workers. Has a criminal record with a teenager. That was expunged. That's mm. very specific. Uh, had some knowledge of police investigative methods and evidence gathering techniques has some means of income but did not work in the early morning hours, hated women for real or perceived wrongs, if married, probably has a submissive spouse who tolerates his sexually deviant behavior, intelligent and articulate, likely began as a voyeur in his late teens or early 20s, lived and or worked near Ventura, California in 1980, neat and well-organized in his personal life, peeped into the windows of many potential victims who were not attacked, Possibly unmarried and did not enter into long-term relationships. Self-assured and confident in his abilities. Sexually functional and capable of, of ejaculation with consenting and non-consenting partners. Yikes. Yowza. Was a skilled and experienced cat burglar and may have begun that way. Was in good physical condition, would appear harmless, would continue committing violent crimes until incapacitated by prison, death, or some other intervention. And finally, would have been described by those who knew him as arrogant, domineering, manipulative, and a, manipulative and a chronic liar. So if anyone knows this guy, Jeez. listen, go to the website, just type it in. Yowza. Can't hurt. Um, in 2013, the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department revealed that microscopic paint chips were discovered at three of the crime scenes, including two homicide scenes and a rape. Um, which suggests that the original Night Stalker may have worked in construction, possibly using a paint spray gun. Hmm. At one murder site, there was construction work taking place nearby, so police are currently working with the developer to identify any subcontractors who are working at the site and obtain employee records, basically. Yeah. Uh, it's known that the East Area Rapist also took things from crime scenes as, like, trophies, sort of. Uh, coins and jewelry in particular. And the FBI has asked that the public be mindful of that. Uh, one detect one FBI agent said, we know that our guy took items. So if for some reason people, whether their family member is deceased or they're cleaning out a storage unit, come across a weird collection of items such as women's IDs, rings, earrings, anything that's out of the ordinary, it could be significant. Mm -hmm. In October 2017, so two months ago, mm -hmm. Uh, law enforcement released new information about the items. They said if anyone comes across a class ring from Lycoming College, uh, any ruby gold jewelry or fine china in Southern California, they should contact the FBI immediately. Um, as of this summer, there are also updated sketches of what he might look like today. And these weren't connected to law enforcement specifically, but uh, alleged. So apparently what happened is they're on the internet, but a 
and have been reported by news media, but apparently what happened is an FBI agent hired um, like a forensic, what are they called? Like artist or a forensic sketch artist? Yeah, something like that. He hired basically like a sketch artist to uh, advance the age of the all the sketches they had from the 60s and 70s mm-hmm. to like what this guy might look like today. Mm-hmm. So technically the police aren't using those yet, but um, they're based on the original sketches that the FBI recently re-released. So they kind of Damn. age advanced them. Yeah. So it's creepy to look at them because it looks like the guy in the early photos or the early drawings advanced to like being 65 years old. It's, it's creepy. Um, in 1991, a previous victim received a phone call from the Night Stalker. Shit. And this is the last time anyone has ever heard from him. It was years before that anyone heard from him and nobody has heard from him after. She received a call, spoke with him for one minute. She said that she could hear a woman and children in the background, which led to the suspicion that he had started a family. Ugh. Yeah. Um, the original Night Stalker slash East Area Rapist case was the motivating factor in the passage of legislation leading to the establishment of California's DNA database, which um, authorizes the collection of the DNA of all the accused and convicted felons in California. So that's the good thing that happened. But um, again, the FBI still has no idea who this guy is. Right. Um, there's a fifty thousand dollar reward, so if anyone knows anything, just Jesus. put your info info out there. They said one call can change the lives. Yeah, can lead to an arrest, and there are still people, many people alive who were victims. So, jeez, yeah. So that's the story of the original Night Stalker, not Richard Ramirez. That's so brutal. Sorry, I feel like I just like blew through that. No, you're fine. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> That's a lot of so talking. That's, that's brutal. Isn't that fucking nuts? Yeah. So he, I mean, Ventura, that's close. That's where the fires are right now. Yeah. <sighs> well, I know there's no good way to uh, come back from one of these stories. Well, a geohoroscope ought to do with a trick. Oh, a geohoroscope, you say? Yes. All right. Well, I got just the thing for you. This is the geoscope for the day. AKA, if you're a Scorpio, you're welcome. <laughs> You thought you were all done hearing confessions from your friends since you've let them know that nothing can surprise you anymore. Suddenly, though, someone calls to real. <laughs> Suddenly, though, someone calls to reveal something new they feel guilty about. Uh oh. And now that you know, you may feel a little guilty too. Oh. <laughs> you know what it is. He is having such a good time with that, though. He knows it's wrong. You know it's wrong. I do know it's a little wrong. I got him a bone that's bigger than him in height and length. <laughs> oh, my God. I got home today after work. And this was on Saturday that this happened. And today's Tuesday night. And I got home after work. And Gio just kept crying at the closet. And I was like, what is happening over there? And I finally opened the closet. And I see that Gio has just stuffed this, like, four-foot <laughs> bone inside the closet. So I pull it out. And Gio's like, yep, that's what I'm waiting for. And I'm like, God damn it. It's peanut butter flavor and everything. And the... Poor baby, he tries to carry it around, but it's literally the size of him. So it's like him trying to drag his own weight in his mouth. It's so sad. So he has, he found like one little tear in it that he can get with his teeth and he just kind of drags it across the floor. I just love when he's like carrying it, carrying it, and then he drops it and the whole house like shakes. Yeah, it's, it's so, big. so heavy. Um, it's... Also, when he, wa- my ha- my living room is so messy because I've been wrapping so many gifts. So it's like boxes everywhere. So he'll start walking with it, but like one end will get stuck. Oh. And he can't anyway. If you guys want to see our friends with video, it's on Patreon. He really is trying so hard. And um, this is now very delayed for you guys. But Christine recently had her um, engagement photos with Blaze. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I definitely jumped on that bandwagon and was like, oh, oh. well, you're going to need someone to like handle Geo. So funny. When you guys get your one on one pictures, like because they wanted Geo in some of them. Sure. And I was like, oh, well, you know, what's going to happen to Geo? Who's going to take care of him? And like hold the leash and everything (laughs) so i threw myself into the mix and i was like i'm coming to your engagement photos (laughs) and i'll play with geo when he's not in the pictures and then blaze ended up not being able to show up right away because of work and so christine (laughs) and me and geo have like an hour and a half to kill and 
all of a sudden I find myself in Christine's engagement photos. I mean, it's like hardcore. Like, put your heads together. Look put at your heads each other together. And now smile. hold each other. Like, yes. put your arms around each other. Sit in M's lap and hold Geo. Like, yes, it we is did all of it. Bananas. And it wasn't even. I think for any other friendship that'd be weird, but for us it was like, okay, how no, do we how do we make it weirder? You're right. It was it was like this isn't this isn't uncomfortable enough. You know, it should be. It sh- I don't want us to stop doing this until i'm cringing yeah like we got to be extremely uncomfortable for this to cross a line (laughs) so let's cross the line and And we just couldn't make it happen and so we one of our listeners aaron was uh the photographer and she did amazing aaron vintage fox photography vintage fox photography she's fucking dope and uh blaze and i also just on the on the sidelines got some uh, engagement photos taken <laughs> so it was it was mainly it was supposed to be a christine and blaze engagement photo shoot <laughs> and what ended up happening is it was me and christine and then me and christine and geo and then me and geo mostly and then you and geo <laughs> mostly me and geo and then blaze stopped by and then blaze was like why don't i just come in for a little bit so but it was great basically was really i good. got professional portrait shots of me and geo which if you follow my instagram at the m schultz you have seen it already go check it out it's hilarious and it uh, i look like a proud parent i just couldn't be happier with a dog it's honestly really fucking funny and if you want to see um her photography it's her handle on instagram is aaron underscore m underscore fox that's right aaron m fox is it under the underscores yeah you're correct yep and um Listen, I know you guys don't give a shit about me, but if you want to check my uh, engagement photos out or anything, or me and Gia or whatever, I see a lot of people on M's post comment, who cares about Christine and Blaze? I care about M and Gio. And I'm like, oh, that's fucking Well, also great. the best part is, so I somehow got looped into the email that Aaron was sending Christine and yeah. Blaze. <laughs> she was sending Christine and Blaze uh, the their photos, and I got looped into it, so I got a personal link to all the photos, too. Yeah. And the title of the album for their engagement shoot is Christine, Geo, Blaze, and M. <laughs> Instead of like Christine and Blaze engagement shots. I'm pretty sure I'm ahead of Blaze. I think it's... I think so. It's Christine. I, I felt like such a dick because I'm like, M, don't look at them yet because I just want to look at them with Blaze first. But then I'm like, then I feel like an asshole because I'm like, M was there first. But <laughs> Also, we did Christmas cards together. We Those did. Those are out now, aren't they? No. Oh, yeah. They're, if you're a Patreon donor... You've they gotten should, one in the mail, right? Not yet. Maybe they should be there, or they should. If you haven't gotten one yet, it's coming. But there is a depending on the holidays, it's coming. But there is definitely a a couple good shots of us in Santa hats, Listen, trying our best to look festive in tried, a eighty degree weathered area. We tried so hard. Anyway, go to X Teen Schiefer on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we're throwing each other's no handles out. No one got to put my handle out. You put yours That's true. out. That's you true. You put yours out pretty much every episode. I do. A lot of people are like, oh, yeah, the M. Schultz. I'm like... Oh, yeah. And also, uh, when I went over... I guess Christine and Aaron had, had met previously. Mm-hmm. I hadn't met Aaron before. So when I knew that I was going to... I knew I, I got there first because Christine texted me and said she was still um, in traffic. And so... I parked my car, didn't know if I was in an area where my car was going to get towed. So I just went up to the first person I saw and was like, hi, do you know if my car's safe here if I park it? And just coincidentally, it happened to be Aaron. And so she (laughs) recognized me and I didn't know who she was. I didn't know who I was looking for. But I was like, oh, is my car getting towed? And I heard, hi, VM Schultz. And I was like, oh my God, is this what being famous feels like? It's (laughs) happening. So anyway, that was my first claim to fame i think maybe a little bit it felt good this is what it also felt jarring i feel like i gave her kind of a deer in the headlights look so i was like no one's ever just known my name without me introducing (laughs) myself before famous feels like no this is what your friend paid four hundred dollars and this woman's gonna photograph take (laughs) photographs so she knows what the fuck you look like but okay close enough (laughs) i'm gonna call it fame (laughs) listen me too Anyway, thank you guys for uh, listening to us. Thank also, you sorry for listening much. to us. Thank you very much. Um, happy New Year's Eve. I hope everyone is safe tonight. Have fun. Be safe. Be very safe. I also hope everyone got good Christmas presents. If you Or Hanukkah. If you uh, follow either of those cel- celebratory events. If not, if you're a Saturnalia kind of dude or gal, I hope you got Saturnalia gifts. Anyway, everyone celebrating the New Year. I hope you figured out your resolutions since... We already think it's November, January 1st. Jesus Christ. Yeah, we think it's November 1st. We think actually it's 2023. We're 
We are living in 1942, and we're very confused. So, um... If you want to learn more about us and you don't already know where to find us, you can find us at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram at ATWWD Podcast. You can also find our Patreon at ATWWD Podcast. Please help us. Hi. Um, we also have our website, and that's why we drink dot com. We have our merch, and that's why we drink dot com. We have our email address, and that's why we drink at gmail dot com, where you can send in your listener stories because we put those out every first of the month, which means tomorrow. tomorrow. You're getting a listener's episode. <laughs> Which means my ass is currently sitting there frantically editing before we have to celebrate the new year. Editing through New Year's Eve. Your last moments in 2017, you're frantically editing, as probably was bound to happen I'm anyway. I'm swearing at our own voices. <laughs> She's texting me being like, I can't believe you fucking said that Fuck five you, times, M. And God now I have to damn edit it, it out. M. None of this makes sense. <laughs> anyway, uh, everyone give Gio a little kiss for uh, Happy New Year because we all wish we were kissing him for New Year's. I won't I will be. be. Oh, I'm so jealous. I know. I'm also not going to be kissing Allison for New Year's, so I'm going to be fair. flying stag. I won't be kissing Blaze for New Year's. He'll be in L.A. You and, you and Blaze can kiss. What? Uh, oh, no, you'll be in Virginia. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's the reason why we won't kiss. Oh, sure. <laughs> uh, anyway, guys, thank you so much for the wonderful year you've given us so far. Holy shit. You guys have given us the best fucking year. Thank you. And in a few weeks, it will be our anniversary. I can't even breathe about it. Thank you for making this the most so wonderful So 2017, year. You, you did it for us. So can't thank you. I can't believe you guys made this possible. Thank you. I'm telling you, and Christine's telling you, that this time last year, at the turn of 2017, we had no idea, one, we'd even be friends. No. We were friends for we maybe weren't. a full 30 days at this point. Yeah, we maybe had spoken twice. And had no idea that we would be having a podcast. Wild. Oh, what if I'm so close to having a dog myself and I don't even know it yet? <laughs> Listen, that's the kind of shit that happened when I had New Year's and I was like, I wish I could have a dog, but I can't. And then two weeks later, I had a dog. <laughs> so you never know. Uh-oh. You never know. Thank you guys for everything. We really love you guys. Happy Thank you. Happy end of the holidays. Happy fucking New Year. Let's make 2018 boss. Let's make it the best fucking year. Let's make year. it boss. Let's make it like... um boss babe action b-o dollar sign dollar sign fuck yes let's make it the best fucking upside down i upside down <laughs> that's <laughs> horrifying we love you guys happy new year thanks for the best year ever and Can't that's why we wait to make 2018 even better and that's why we drink, drink. oh damn hang on got how no you gotta hit the tops I feel like those glasses just don't work together because they're both so big. Oh, that's even worse. Sounds like you're banging your head against something. No. <laughs> wait, here. Let's try both. Oh, here, I have an empty one. Oh, wait, that's the one you were using. Yeah. Okay. Go. Wait. <laughs> wait, there's a wine bottle behind you. Use that one. A wine bottle? Should we use two empty ones? No, no, no. No, here, use this, use that, and this, an empty one. I think that'll work better. There it is. <laughs> That's why we drink. That was so easy, Em. God, we're so talented.